All right, this is your liberal conservative pendulum swing um, lecture on, on social changes happening 70s, 80s, 90s. Um, so what we're going to be looking at in the next two lectures in this last part of this unit is how uh, the nation increasingly becomes more divided after the 60s. So um, we talked about in the 60s how there was the new left, how um, some liberals left the Democratic Party or leaned away from some of the more new left things like gay rights, civil rights, etc. Remember that previously being quote-unquote liberal revolved mostly around economic policy, so supporting Roosevelt, Johnson-type poverty relief programs, uh, union uh, support, etc. Um, and they weren't necessarily as on board with social change, the social change of the 60s that we see. So we see the new left of the 60s, and coming out of the 60s and a lot of the changes that happened, we also see a new right. So again, we see um, a spreading of the spectrum, um, losing membership into in the, the moderate kind of category of both Democrats and Republicans. And then we'll see this constant kind of pendulum swing between liberal reform and then conservative reform and liberal and conservative that we see all the way up until today and some of our gridlock problems. So we're going to look at... Um, the groups of the 60s um, and some of the things that they pushed for and how those changes continue or are reversed throughout the 70s, 80s, and 90s. So the women's movement of the 60s, remember a big thing they were promoting was um, contraception and or reproductive rights, um, working rights, education rights. And so there are moments of um, progress and there's also some limitations as well. So um, the conservative backlash to um, to the women's movement is kind of exemplified by a woman named Phyllis Schlafly and just a, a conservative activist going against abortion rights, reproductive rights, etc. Um, also against the Equal Rights Amendment. So Equal Rights Amendment was a big push in the 70s. It failed. It has never passed. It's been brought back a couple of times, um, but it has never passed partially because of conservative activism, also partially because of much like all the other civil rights groups, um, like SNCC, CORE, um, there was a splintering of the feminist movement too as far as what the focus would be, and so it lost some of its momentum. So again, Equal Rights Amendment was um, attempted but failed. But just know that as strong as the feminist movement was, there was also this very strong conservative response led by people like Phyllis Schlafly that were speaking out against some of the um, feminist values and goals. A big um, success for the feminist movement was the Roe v. Wade decision um, that allowed abortion in certain cases and at certain times in a woman's pregnancy. Um, that was continued and protected a, f a few decades later by Planned Parenthood versus Casey. Um, and this is why I'm mentioning this one. You'll never see this particular Roe v. Wade you might see on the test. Planned Parenthood versus Casey, not going to be on the test, but you could definitely bring it up as part of a synthesis. Um, this is a case that's been coming up in the news lately because what this the Supreme Court established is that there cannot be any undue burden, quote-unquote, so undue burden for a woman in getting an abortion. Um, it's a very vague gray term, um, and so states... Lately, um, several of them have been kind of limiting the number of abortion clinics, how long a woman has to wait, the hoops that she has to jump through to get an abortion. Um, and so people have been citing this case, either for it or against it, um, talking about what it means to be an undue burden. So the interpretation of that clause um, is what's been in the news lately with um, discussions of um, reproductive rights. The women's pay inequality has continued back in the 60s. It was about 61 cents to every dollar a man made in the same profession. Um, this has been in the news a lot. Obama kind of took it on as one of his things. The quote that is frequently thrown around, the statistic that's thrown around today is seven. so a woman earns 70 cent, seven, 77 cents for every dollar a man makes, um, again, in the same profession. Um, that statistic is Controversial, um, also debated as to what it actually means. Um, mostly where pay inequality comes into play is in the private sector. So in like a, a public sector where um, salaries are open, not so much of a problem. Private sector where salaries are negotiated, this is where you do see some of the pay inequality. Um, the big 
kind of demographic that does suffer from pay inequality is when a woman has decided to start a family. And so there is a strong statistical evidence for uh, women who have decided to be mothers, um, being docked or getting paid less if they have to work different hours, so the same number of hours but different hours to work around daycare and things like that. So the pay inequality does still persist. It's not as clear cut as literally this much money per this much money that a man makes. But um, again, that's an ongoing discussion that you could definitely mention in the synthesis paragraph. Um, environmental movement that got going in the 60s, again, with Rachel Carson and Silent Spring, formation of the EPA by Nixon, um, continues with a lot of regulation that gets put into place, like the Clean Air Act, Clean Air and Water Act, and a lot of this is inspired by things you can see a picture here of the famous Love Canal spill that hopefully you've studied in environmental science if you um, take that AP class. Love Canal is just an example in New York of a uh, body of water, public water supply that um, companies were just dumping toxic waste into um, and was seeping into the watershed. So again, Clean Air and Water Act, we still have it today, um, regulates pollution and water pollution. Endangered Species Act also passed, um, I believe in the 70s, again, protecting different species, and there's all kinds of levels of there's endangered, there's um, protected, all different levels that species can fall under. Um, Superfund was another huge one that has been really successful. Um, this was a government pool of money um, that companies could apply for to clean up. So if they had been burying their toxic waste someplace that could seep into the watershed or other um, concerns to the public, the government had the funds that these companies could use, and this is an example of all the places that got cleaned up because of that. Um, so Superfund is considered one of the huge success of environmental protection and cleanup um, as a government program. Kyoto Accords in the 90s and then Copenhagen um, in the 2000s. So the big environmental discussion of late has been starting in the, in the 90s and even earlier, a little bit earlier. Um, this discussion of climate change, Kyoto Accords um, we did not sign on to. Um, and Copenhagen we did agree to, but that discussion of climate change in the U.S. and what treaties we will and will not sign on to kind of hinges on a couple main debates that you could reference if this came up um, on an essay topic or um, short answer or something like that. Um, one is sovereignty. So anytime America is signing a treaty, we like to protect our sovereignty. Think back to like the Treaty of Versailles in World War I. Um, we didn't like being told the amount of... Um, greenhouse gases that we could or could not produce. Um, we also for a long time debated and argued that it was unfair that say China and India, huge greenhouse gas producers, um, were able to produce less because they were considered still developing and their argument was that we got to go through a period of industrialization and pollution, they should too, um, but we didn't like that so again we wouldn't sign on to it. Um, we also, private businesses also didn't like being regulated and told how much pollution they could or could not produce. So, um, and again, some of the amounts that came out of Kyoto Accords, the, the kind of strict regulation, and were, were pretty hefty and were going to be expensive for com countries and companies to um, comply to. Copenhagen, we do agree to, um, and more recently we've seen in some of the um, other negotiations that have been happening in the last few years, um, we have made more progress as far as agreeing to limitations and policies towards China and India. So it, the dialogue has become much um, more problem-solving-oriented orient, problem solving oriented and has, has definitely made progress. But big issues, remember economic sovereignty um, and us compared to China and India. Um, the backlash about, against a lot of this regulation um, ha starts in the 70s and into the 80s. Um, a big period of deregulation was during Reagan's administration, but it actually started uh, with, with Carter. If, remember that they were dealing with stagflation, and so they were trying to cut down on government spending um, and trying to stimulate the economy, and so lessening the regulations that private businesses had to um, comply with, they were expensive, um, was the goal. So again, Carter kind of got going. Remember, Carter is a Democrat. Reagan continues... Um, and increases it. And this has both positive and, and negative ramifications. Um, the deregulation in the environmental sector, um, they put 
He appointed someone to head the EPA that was actively against the environmentalist movement, um, and they lowered a lot of the regulation on the expensive laws that companies had to comply with as far as pollution. Um, this led to Greenpeace and Sierra Club to really protest against this, so much so that Reagan listened and kind of went back on that. Um, so he actually did do some good things. He ended up increasing the um, EPA's spending. He um, a lot more species were put onto the endangered, were protected under the Endangered Species Act during his time. Um, so again, he did he did. So there was kind of again this pendulum swing of like decreased regulation that, that there was a liberal backlash to that, and then Reagan kind of came reversed a little bit of that deregulation and actually helped the EPA out, expanded national wilderness, national forests, etc. So again, we just keep, see this constant give and take in this swing back and forth. But um, as far as the environmental movement, a lot of progress, a lot of laws that um, were passed. Immigration, another big thing um, that we haven't talked about in a while. So thinking back all the way to the 1920s, if you remember after that big period of immigration during the Gilded Age and into the Progressive Era, if you remember the National Origins Act in the 1920s, we see that spike in nativism, Sacquin Vanzetti, all that. Remember, National or Origins Act introduced quotas that greatly reduced um, the number of immigrants that could come from places like Eastern Europe or the Mediterranean. We're really focused on encouraging immigration from Northern European countries like France and Belgium and Germany and things like that. Um, the Immigration Act of 1965 was the first big law since the 20s that reversed a lot of that. Um, that uh, Kennedy was a big proponent of getting rid of it. He saw the Origins Act as nativist, racist, um, and he pushed for it. He was assassinated, so he never saw this act, and then Johnson and Congress get this done. What it did is it got rid of the quota system as far as, like, countries could only send these few and what it introduced is like category quotas like this many new scientists or this many families and um, this many unskilled workers agricultural workers students etc and so what this did is it opened up immigration for a lot of people and totally changed um, what the US population looks like today um, so we see a lot of, again, remember the Cold War is happening, so we see a lot of Eastern Europeans, a lot of Asians. So before, like, 6% of immigrants or something like that were, were from Asia, and we see it jump to, like, something in the 30%. So again, um, and again, same thing from Eastern Europe. They're fleeing a lot of the communist dictatorships in Eastern Europe. Asia, same thing. And then we see a ton coming in from Latin America. So again, we see a diversification of the population um, and an increase from some of those non-Northern European countries. Um, this raises concerns for some, and so we see a small backlash or a swing backwards from that kind of liberal immigration policy um, with the Immigration Reform and Control Act, and that's a typo, it should be of 86. Again, you don't need to remember, remember these years specifically, just remember like 60s liberalized, 80s, we see some backwards trend um, the Immigration Reform and Control Act made um, increased regulation on illegal immigration. So from the 70s and 80s, the big concern was illegal immigrants coming in. Again, you've got a flood of immigrants coming in from Latin America that was particularly concerning to Americans, and a lot of Asians coming in from Canada. Um, and so the Immigration Reform and Control Act helped, um, again, you see the signing, sorry, of the Immigration Act of 1965, and then the reverse, some reversal of that with um, the Immigration Reform and Control Act. Again, increasing control of illegal immigration, but it also did a few things um, that people referenced in today's kind of gridlocked immigration debate, is amnesty. So it, twice in the 80s, um, we see amnesty granted to undocumented workers, trying to solve kind of that crisis of what to do with them, deportation, etc. So twice amnesty is granted to undocumented workers in the 80s, um, and so you've seen people call for that today to kind of deal with the, the backlog of undocumented workers that are in America today, granting them amnesty as long as there's no criminal record and some other requirements. So again, that was the last big immigration reform law that we've had. Um, and again, you see this the swing between super liberal and then backing off on that, um, and just this the um, controversy between 
liberal views on immigration and conservative views on immigration. Last group that we'll look at today is the LGBTQ community. Um, remember that again, um, with Stonewall Inn, in the late 60s, gay rights movement getting going, um, they were protesting things like the criminalization of homosexuality, um, discrimination and jobs against homosexuality. Um, so an, remember that one big push is they didn't want to be it to be labeled a mental disease or disorder. And so in 1973, the APA actually, the American Psychological Association says, issues the decision that it is not actually a mental disorder or a disease. So that was a huge piece of progress. Um, the 80s, um, we see reversals of a lot of the laws that have been put in place in the 50s, making it okay to fire someone for being homosexual. So again, a lot of those re laws are reversed in the 80s. Unfortunately, we also see the huge AIDS epidemic in the 80s, um, which hurt the, that community, um, kind of giving, again, this, this bad image to it. But um, there were a lot of great campaigns that came out of that, um, that really, again, into the 90s and 2000s, um, that reversed a lot of the neg negative stereotypes that came out of the AIDS epidemic. Um, big step um, backwards in some ways in 93 with Clinton was the don't ask, don't tell policy in the military. And that was where, again, homosexuals could not be kicked out of the military, um, but they were expected not to be openly gay. Um, so that was kind of a blow to, to that, those efforts that was repealed by Obama in 2010. And so again, we're seeing this swing between um, steps backwards in the 80s and 90s to progress more recently. Um, gay marriage, remember, wasn't the focus of um, the gay rights movement in the 60s and 70s. It increasingly became so in the early 2000s with lots of debate. We even had debate and controversy in the last few years, especially with clerks not willing to hand out licenses in states where it's been legalized. Um, but the big piece of progress for the, that community was in 2015 when the Supreme Court um, said that gay marriage was in fact constitutional and legal. Um, this will obviously probably be appealed by states, but again, this was recently last year where they issued this huge ruling, um, and we'll see how that plays out in the next few years or so. But that's seen as a, a huge piece of progress for the LGBTQ community. Um, the new big issue now is uh, making sure that transgender um, people have equal rights and equal protections. Um, you've seen a lot of discussion of like bathrooms and athletics recently, so that'll be kind of the, the new frontier for that community as far as um, making sure that equality is achieved. So those are some of the issues um, that we see continuing today, some of the progress that they made, some of the steps backward that they had experienced. Um, and again, the issues that continue today that you could definitely discuss in a synthesis paragraph. And that is it.